Well, that's a lot better than, hey, you come and preach, right? Hey, good to see you tonight. What a wonderful time we had here in God's house this morning. I feel like that the Holy Spirit of God was just very strong and evident in this place, and I believe we started a good path toward revival, and I've just been counting down the moments this afternoon to get to be back with you tonight here at Bronston. It's good to have family with me tonight, my wife and my two sons, Amy, Alistair, and Andrew. You know, a lot of Baptist preachers preach with alliteration. You know, they all alliterate their points. All their points will start with the same letter, and so I figured God wanted me to have an alliterated family. I'm Alan. He gave me an Amy. Our first is Alistair, and then the next one had to be an A2, Andrew. So we're the four A's. And it's good for me to have my sister, Lillian Norris, with me tonight. Thank God for the healing touch of God that's been in her life this year. I know your pastor has prayed for her, and some of you here in this room, perhaps over the last year, has prayed for her as she has fought a fight with cancer, and God has won. Amen. And we thank God for that, and she'll continue to uh, uh, work with that, but, but God is very good, and we're thankful for his healing touch on her life. Christy and Eddie Hudson and their dear family, uh, fellow church members of ours at High Street Baptist Church with us tonight. So it just feels good to have family and friends, and then all of you here together in the house tonight. I feel like that Baptist preacher, you know, Baptist preachers are kind of glad to show up and preach just wherever they are. You may have heard about the one that went to preach at a prison one night, and he said, I'm glad to be here tonight. That was bad enough, but he said, next, I'm glad each of you are here tonight. (laughs) Then he really made a mess out of things when he said, I'm sure the world's a better place because we're all here tonight. (laughs) But it feels really good, honestly, uh, to be here. Andrew, I've got to tell you something about my youngest son, Andrew. About four years ago now, when I resigned the church where we were serving in Lexington to take this position with the convention, Andrew was about six years old at the time, and he didn't understand this new ministry that we would be doing and that I'd be engaged in. And a night or two after I had made the announcement to the church, we were talking to some friends, and I heard some laughter where Andrew was standing. He probably doesn't even remember saying this, but I just asked. I said, what has Andrew said? Because he's that kind of kid. If you get a chance to talk to him tonight, you'll figure that out. But I said, what has Andrew said? And the lady there standing said, Andrew's here saying that you're not a preacher anymore. (laughs) And I said, is that true? And she said, yes. He said, you've quit preaching. You've resigned as our pastor. And you've gone to work for the KGB. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I'm glad I can tell you tonight I don't work for the KGB. I do work for you, though, the Kentucky Baptist Convention. and, And I'm thankful If I didn't say it this morning, let me make sure I say it tonight. I'm so thankful for great churches like Bronston all over this part of Kentucky, but also literally all over our commonwealth that takes very seriously the calling of God to be involved in missions. I thank God that you're not only a giving church, but you're a going church. But thank you so much that part of your missions dollars you share through the cooperative program of Kentucky and Southern Baptist. Now, make sure you listen to how I just said that. You don't give to the cooperative program. You give through the cooperative program. And because you're faithful to give, and many churches around this state and other uh, state conventions are very faithful to give, the sunlight literally never goes down on the gospel witness that is all over the world because of faithful givers and faithful mission-minded churches like you here at Bronston. Uh, Speaking of missions, I want to talk to you tonight about the mission. You know, as you're going into revival service, you begin to pray about the messages that God would have you to deliver. And I thought I had a preaching plan until this afternoon. And as I continue to think and pray, God put another message on my heart. And then when we came tonight, 
the good songs that we sung together. We have a story to tell, and Jesus saves. You know, we didn't plan that, did we, brother? But the Holy Spirit of God. Let me show you how great God the Holy Spirit is. He can work in our planning, but He's bigger than us, and He can work and often does work even when we don't get our feeble minds together. And so God had placed it on the heart of whoever picked out the songs tonight to sing those songs because they're going to lead us right into the thought that the Holy Spirit has put on my heart. I want you to open up your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Don't you love the book of Acts? Well, we love all the Bible, right? Because it's God's Word. It's God's very breathed out. We believe in the absolute inspiration of Scripture. And because God inspired Scripture, it's infallible. It's perfectly true without any mixture of error. And so we love all the Word of God. But as a church... And as leaders in the church, we better read the book of Acts every now and then. Because it details for us how the church was started and how God used His church after giving them the gift of His Holy Spirit. Well, we begin to see all this unfold in Acts chapter 1. Now remember, when you're opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, our Lord and Savior, 40 days before this, had come up from his entombment. We're thankful tonight that we do not serve a crucified Jesus. Now we serve a Jesus who was crucified and who was buried, but thanks be to God, on the third day, he rose again. And after his great resurrection, the Lord Jesus spent 40 days upon this earth proving his resurrection to many, many people. He would meet with people one-on-one. He would meet with people one-on-two. He would meet with the apostles. And then he would meet with a crowd of over 500 brethren, the Bible says, just showing the world and leaving an historical record that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is alive. And so post-resurrection, those 40 days, He spent proving his resurrection, giving some final details, some final instructions for his church as they would go out to do his mission. And then he gathers them together at about that 40th day out in Bethany, out on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And Jesus would teach them one more time and then he would ascend. Now, I want you to see this very clearly from the outset tonight. As Jesus had that last moment upon this earth to teach his church before his ascension, he would teach them about the mission. So I want us to think about the mission tonight. If you wouldn't, you're able, would you stand with me as we read together of God's word? Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, just to get the full details, we'll read down through Verse 11, but pay very close attention to verses 6 through 8. We'll walk through those together tonight. Bible says, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now look at these final details. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These are angels, obviously. And notice what they say in verse 11. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up 
from you into heaven shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Would you pray with me, Lord? Thank you for the great blessing of your word. Thank you, Father, that we serve a risen Savior who, Lord, lives in our hearts even right now through the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you that we can be indwelt by your Spirit and as we thought about this morning, we can be filled with your Spirit. But Father, help us to take that filling of the Spirit and let it spill over in our gospel witness, Lord, to this community, to this state, this nation, and this world. Lord, help us to be all about the mission. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing with me. Would you be seated? I always find it interesting when I hear people talk about last words. Have you ever been by someone's side when they uttered their last words before they slipped out of this life to the next life? As a pastor, I've had that privilege many times to be at someone's side and They'll usually say something meaningful. It's interesting. I've seen people who have been at such a low ebb of life that they weren't able to say anything for days and then just before they would cross in to glory, they would utter some beautiful words. There's some interesting historical last words. Maybe you'll remember the name of one of the greatest artists who ever lived, Leonardo da Vinci. He's a great artist, and he had some interesting last words. They say that just before da Vinci died, he said this. He said, I have offended God and mankind because my work never reached the quality that it should have. Can you imagine that? A great artist like Leonardo da Vinci saying, my work just wasn't as good as it should have been. Those are interesting last words, right? There's some other interesting last words. I think about Benjamin Franklin, one of our country's forefathers. Franklin said this right before he died. He said, a dying man can do nothing easy. Those were his last words, and then he just died. One of our presidents of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, he said something interesting right before he died. He just simply said, Four last words. He said, put out the light. Those were his last words, and then he died. Well, we've read together some last words tonight, but what sets the last words we've read tonight apart from any other last words is that usually last words are spoken just before someone dies. These are not the last words of a dying man. Again, these are the last words of a man who did die on a Friday afternoon, was buried that Friday evening, stayed down in the grave through Saturday, and on Sunday morning, he resurrected and he shall never die again. These are the last words of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as you think about these being his last words, it should come as no surprise that the very last words Jesus would utter from his lips before he ascended off of this earth and he went back to be with his father, were all about the mission. Amen. Now why is that? That's because Jesus' life was all about the mission. Think about it like this. When Jesus was given into the womb of that little virgin girl Mary, she was espoused to a man by the name of Joseph. And you remember as Joseph was wrestling with the news, the Bible tells us that an angel came and spoke to Joseph, and that angel told Joseph exactly what to call this son who would be coming. And you remember what the angel said? That angel said, you shall call his name Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus is named Jesus. Because he would be one who would lead people out of their sins. It's all about the mission. His name is about the mission. Call him Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. Jesus grew up to be about a 30-year-old man, and he introduces his public ministry 
by going down to the Jordan River where he'd be baptized by John the Baptist. As John looked across the bank of that river and saw Jesus Christ coming down that hill, do you remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Make sure you're tracking. The angel said, Joseph, name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. John the Baptist looks and he sees his cousin coming down the hillside toward the Jordan. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus, as he would summarize his life and his ministry, do you remember what he said about himself? Jesus said it like this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Are you tracking? Name him Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then the Lord Jesus, in the upper room with the apostles, the night he would be betrayed. You remember, he took the Passover elements, and with them he instituted the Lord's Supper. He talked about the body that would be broken. And then when he came to the cup, remember what he said. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for what reason? For the forgiveness of sins. You can't miss it. All through his life, his very name, the introduction of his public ministry, the summary of his mission, and before he goes out to face the cross, over and over and over again, the New Testament makes it very, very clear, Jesus came to save people from their sins. So it should come as no surprise as the Lord can say one last thing to the apostles. And as the Lord could leave one last set of instructions for us, His church, it should never ever surprise us that it should be all about the mission. Now make no mistake, His mission is to save people from their sins. And listen to me, folks. If we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and we dare to call ourselves a Christian church, should not His mission be our mission? If it was Jesus' mission to preach the gospel and, and lead the captives out of captivity and to tell people the good news of God through His blood, if that was His mission, it's our mission. Amen. But may I tell you tonight that the church these days is often sadly mistaken about its mission? Several months ago, I was reading an article in Outreach Magazine written by Greg Lowry, and Greg Lowry quoted some research that had been done just before that. Some researchers had, had, had uh, given a questionnaire to a thousand church members, which they thought was a good sampling from all different types of churches, different denominations of churches from across America. And a part of that questionnaire was this interesting question. Now here's the question that I find most interesting. They asked those thousand people across America, why does the church exist? That's a good question, isn't it? We need to ask ourselves that. Bronston, First Baptist Church, occasionally, you need to ask yourself that question. Why do we exist as a local manifestation of His church? Why has God placed us here? And then the church universally needs to ask that question. Why are we here on this earth? Why does the church exist? Well, in this survey, when they ask that question, I want you to listen to this. 89% of those who responded to that question, you know what they said? They said this, the church exists to meet my and my family's spiritual needs. And only 11% of those who took that survey said, the church exists to reach the lost people in this community. May I tell you something? When that's the attitude of God's church, that church is in a very backslidden condition. Amen. 
And I don't want you to misunderstand me. A part of the purpose of the church is to disciple you. A part of God's purpose and plan for His church is to come alongside you and help meet some spiritual needs in your life. But when you get to the place that you think the church is all about you, you're sadly mistaken. Uh, You have developed the kind of false ideology that I talked about this morning. You, You have decided that the church is yours and it's all about you. Remember what we said this morning, this is not your church. This is God's church. And God's purpose for His church ought to be your purpose. God's purpose for His church is to reach those who are lost, who are dying. And let me remind you, not only are they dying a physical death, but they're on their way to a spiritual death in an eternal place called hell. And our purpose is to be God's purpose, and that is to reach the lost who are around us. And so I hope you're asking yourself a question at this point. How can I be an on-mission Christian? How can I be a purposeful Christian? I think we'll have revival. If we'll do what God shared with us this morning, if we can give our lives over to a fresh feeling of His Holy Spirit, and then if we can link that with being on purpose with Him, I'm telling you, You'll be amazed at what God will do right here at Bronston through the work of this church. You'll sell yourself out to a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit and then get on mission with God, not just for Haiti and not just for the nations, but for Pulaski County and for Bronston and Burnside and Somerset and Ferguson. If you'll get on mission with God to reach this county for the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll be amazing what God could do through this one church if we'll just get on mission. So how is it that we live our lives as on mission Christians? I want to challenge you to be on mission. I'm preaching to you to church tonight. Then tomorrow night, you come back and you bring a friend with you that's lost and we'll share the gospel. But I'm here to tell you, revival's for the church. And a church that needs to be revived is a church that needs to get on mission. So how do I be an on-mission Christian? Well, if you want to be on mission, number one, let me share with you tonight, you cannot allow Satan to distract you from the mission. If you're going to be on mission, you can't be distracted from the mission. Look again at verse 6. I want you to see the apostles' question here in this verse. They come up to Jesus, and again, get the picture in your mind. Here's Jesus. He has spent about 40 days on the earth. They're gathered together there on the Mount of Olives. He's he's about to ascend, and they come to him. And sometime before this, remember this, Jesus had met on another mountain with them over in Galilee, and he had given them the Great Commission And now they come up to him and they said, Now, Lord, in verse 6, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, why did they ask that question? You need to remember this. Many of those who followed Jesus initially were looking for a political Messiah. And that's okay. Because you need to understand there are two types of prophecies in the Old Testament regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, there are about 365 Old Testament Messianic prophecies. That's easy to remember. One for about each of the days of the year. 365 days of the year, there are that many Messianic prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. He's prophesied over and over again, beginning all the way back in the book of Genesis God prophesied that He was sending a Savior. He was sending a Messiah. Many of those prophecies would be fulfilled when Jesus Christ came the first time. Many of those would be fulfilled. But there are many other Old Testament prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled in Jesus. But here's the good news. All of those that King Jesus fulfilled in His first advent or in His first coming, they're just proof positive that He'll take care of the rest when He comes the next time. 
I want to remind you tonight that this world has not seen the last of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is coming again. Let that be a theme of your heart. Sing it in your songs. Preach it in your sermons. Study it in your lessons. Jesus Christ is coming again. Did you see here in the passage, there are those apostles and they're out there at Bethany and Jesus begins to ascend back to the right hand of the Father and there they stand with their mouths open and their eyes wide and they're watching as Jesus goes up, up, up and here come these two angels and what's the message? The same way, in the same manner that you're seeing the Lord go up he will return. He went up in the clouds. He's coming back in the clouds. He went up in a physical body. He's coming back in a physical body. Jesus Christ is coming again. And all of the things he did not fulfill the first time, he will fulfill the next time when he comes again. But these apostles, they, they wanted it then, and they wanted it now. And so they come up to him and they say, Lord... Is now the time that you're going to restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were tired of the Romans, right? They wanted independence. They wanted freedom. And you can't blame them. That's what was on their heart. But I want you to understand as you compare that and contrast that with what Jesus had told them to do, you're going to see that they were very, very distracted. Jesus told them to be on mission. Jesus told them to share the gospel and to make disciples, but they wanted to know, Lord, are you going to take care of the Romans right now? But notice how Jesus redirected them in verse 7. Jesus basically said, fellas, this is none of your business. <laughs> notice he says in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Aren't you glad tonight that we don't have to know everything? I don't need to know everything. If I tried to know everything, it would just blow up this little mind that I have. And, and when it comes to the second coming of Jesus, I want you to hear me. We need to know that He is coming again. And we need to know that we're to be prepared to see Him when He comes again. But regarding exactly when it's going to be, do you remember what Jesus Himself said? Jesus said that he didn't know, nor did the angels of glory, only the Father knew. And so Jesus said to those apostles, it's not for you to know when I'm coming again. It's not for you to know when I'm going to come and, and take care of the Romans. By the way, when he comes the next time, he's not going to just take care of the Romans, is he? He's going to take care of all things. He's going to set the record straight, amen? He's going to make all the wrongs right. Are you going to go home tonight and waste time watching that debate? I, I probably will watch some of it, but I'm, I'm glad that I can remind you tonight that the hope of this world isn't in a Clinton or a Trump, but the hope of this world is in King Jesus. Amen. And when King Jesus comes again, he's going to take care of all things, but he looks at those apostles and he says, it's not for you to know right now. Just trust God. God says that a lot of, about a lot of things we go through in life, right? A lot of times we have questions. Lord, why am I going through this? Or why is my loved one facing this issue in his or her life? Or God, why do you let bad things happen to seemingly good people? I'm glad that I can tell you in the words of the old song, we'll understand it better by and by. God's going to take care of things. They wanted to know, when will you take care of the Romans? Jesus says, it's not for you to know. That's left up to the mind and the sovereignty of God. They were, here's my point, they were distracted from the mission. A better question would have been, Lord, you've given us the great commission. Lord, you've told us to go throughout the world and to preach the gospel and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that you've commanded us. Lord, how do we do it? That would have been the good question, but they were distracted. You'll remember this, a little over a decade ago, we became as Americans very acquainted with the phrase, weapons of mass destruction. You remember that? 
We waged war looking for weapons of mass destruction. May I tell you tonight that Satan has levied against God's church right now not weapons of mass destruction, but weapons of mass distraction. We get distracted. And all the silly things that occupy our thoughts. The worthless things that we get carried away with. I work with churches all the time, and I told you a little bit about that this morning. Some get carried away with, with music styles. Some with other generational choices. We even have some that get carried away with trying to figure out who's going to be saved and who won't be saved. May I tell you tonight, that's none of our business. Our business is to be on mission with the king and go out and tell the world that Jesus saves. While we're distracted, people are dying and people are going to hell. Here we are in Pulaski County, Kentucky in about 8 18.9, so let's just call it 20%. According to the latest research, about 20% of our county, and by the way, we're in the group that's the most reached counties, among the most reached counties of the state. But think about this. Only about 20% of Pulaski County goes to church any Sunday. Only about 20%. And that's what the research tells us. But you begin to add all that up. And in our county of about 65,000 people, if only 20% go to church, you come up with that number and then you try to count them in the congregation. I'm here to tell you, you'll have a hard time counting that many in church. Bottom line is this. While we live in a supposedly reached county, Most of our fellow countyans right here in Pulaski County are lost and dying and they're going to hell and we're playing games in the church. We're distracted. Reminds me of an old story that comes from English folklore. It's about a king who was a king over a, a great kingdom and he had condemned a man to his death and sent him to the prison the far reaches of the kingdom and the day that that man was to be put to death there was some evidence that was presented to the king that that he was actually innocent so the king weighed the evidence and he said I've got to do something about this and I have to do it quickly because he's going to be put to death today and so he wrote out a pardon and rolled it up in the scroll and, and found his best page and he put that page, uh, that scroll in the page boy's hand, and he said, son, get on your fastest horse and take this as quickly as you can to the other side of the kingdom because this man's going to be put to death today if the warden doesn't get this pardon. So the little boy, the page boy, was excited. He, He finally had a mission from the king, and he tucked that little scroll down in his cloak and And he got on top of that horse and as swiftly as he could he started riding that steed to the other side of the kingdom and on his way there his mind began to wonder and he began to think about that prisoner. He said, you know that prisoner's been over there for years. Certainly when he's released he'll want some better clothes to wear on his way home. So he stopped and it took a certain amount of time for him to buy a new set of clothes to take to that prisoner got back on the horse, and then he began to think about food. He said he's been eating prison food all these years. Certainly, as he gets out of prison today, it'd be nice if I could take him a fresh meal. And so he stops, and he gets him a meal prepared, and he takes it on to the prison. And and finally, he arrives on the grounds of that prison, and he goes into the room of the warden, and he presents that scroll. The warden takes the scroll, and he unfurls it and he begins to read and all of a sudden the countenance on the face of the warden begins to fall and with very serious tones he looks at the little page boy and he says son your moments too late execution has been carried out and the story says that the little page boy had his knees and down on his knees he began to cry and he wailed out over And over again. And these were his words. What's the king going to say? 
He would cry it out over and over again. What's the king going to say? What's the king going to say? May I tell you tonight, the king of kings and the Lord of lords has granted to us the good news. We're, we're clay vessels, but in these clay vessels, He's placed the gospel. And our commission is to go throughout the highways and the byways and to tell lost women, men, and boys and girls that there is a Jesus that saves. But the hour is getting late. And while we're distracted in the church, and while we're fussing about this, and while we're feuding about that, People in Pulaski County are lost and they're dying and every day they're going to hell. And I just wonder what's the king going to say? If you're going to be on mission, don't be distracted, Bronston, from the mission. Don't be distracted from the mission. If you're going to be on mission, you can't be distracted from the mission but secondly, you've got to rely on the power for the mission. I love what Jesus says in verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Listen. If Israel was going to be restored, if they were going to be led away from the Romans, if the Romans were going to be defeated... Those apostles were going to need Caesar's kind of power. But that wasn't their mission. The mission was to win the world with the gospel. And to do that, they would need a power that was even greater than Caesar's power. They were going to need Holy Spirit power. And I want you to see the command is in what we talked about this morning. The command is for us to be filled with the Spirit. But watch this simple statement of fact. When you're filled with the Spirit, or in other words, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witness. See, we get this thing all wrong. We think if we can just memorize certain scriptures, at that point we can be the witness that God wants us to be. Now that certainly wouldn't hurt, but that's not all that's required. And it's only a very minor part of what's required. Let me tell you, when you'll be the witness that, God's want you to, that God wants you to be, that it will start at the point when you're relying on God the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what we need to be the witness that God's called us to be. Listen, if you know John 3, 16 and you have a personal testimony, you get filled with God the Holy Spirit and you'll be the witness that God wants you to be. Just look at the life of the Apostle Peter. I love to think about Peter and who he was before the cross. You remember that. Peter's the eager beaver apostle, right? I read a book some years ago that was entitled 12 Ordinary Men. John MacArthur wrote it. And when it came down to the chapter on Peter, you know what the title of that chapter was? He said, Peter, the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. It was about right. A lot of times, Peter would just open his mouth and take one foot out and put the other foot in. And boy, Peter really put his foot in his mouth one night when he said, Lord, I'll, I'll never forsake you. Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, before the cock crows, you'll do it three times. Can you imagine that, how, how low Peter was? Thanks be to God, Jesus, post-resurrection, restored Peter, right? Feed my sheep, Peter. And Peter was perfectly restored, but you add that to the filling of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit comes down in Acts chapter 2. They're filled with God the Holy Spirit. And what does Peter do? He goes out into the crowded streets of Jerusalem and among the same people to whom he had denied an association with the Lord, he begins to preach boldly the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 3,000 people are saved that day at Pentecost. I'm telling you, when you get full of God the Holy Spirit and you rely on Him as the power for your testimony, you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life. Rely on the power for the mission. We have everything we need to win this community for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need. You know, a lot of churches think... We'll out-entertain the world. 
We'll build our church that way. Well, you can build a crowd that way, but you'll not build a church. You can't out-entertain the world, but you've got something the world doesn't have. You have the Holy Spirit of power and promise. I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul said when he wrote back to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. He said, And I, brethren... When I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined to know not one thing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What if we had some folks in Pulaski County like that? I've determined not to know anything among you. Then Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And He went on to say, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but, listen to this, in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's what people need. They need a witness that will be demonstrated the power of God, the Holy Spirit, so that people's faith would not be in the wisdom of men. Let me tell you something. You can have faith in men, and you'll go straight to hell. You need to have faith in God. Paul said, that's the way I came to you. He came relying on the power for the mission. You want to be on mission as a Christian, as a church, Don't get distracted from the mission. Rely on the power for the mission. And then thirdly, you go out and just execute the plan of the mission. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in verse 8, ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We've dealt with that verse so many times that it seems commonplace. How many times have you heard that? You've heard that all your life if you, like me, have grown up in church. We're to be His witnesses beginning in in Jerusalem, out to Judea, then over to Samaria, and then ultimately all over the earth. We've dealt with that so many times that it just rolls off of our lips. But may I tell you this evening, that's really never been easy. Put yourself in the shoes of those apostles. <laughs> there Jesus looks at them and he says, I want you to be my witness in Jerusalem. <laughs> That's where Jesus was just executed 40 days earlier at the demand of an angry mob. And Jesus says, you be my witness in Jerusalem. And then he says, you be my witness in In Judea, well, Judea had done what? They would primarily rejected the ministry of Christ. And Jesus says, you go back to Judea and you be my witness. And then for good measure, he throws in Samaria. You Sunday school scholars, you know what that means. I can just hear a shrieking sound as he said, you be my witness in Samaria. Most of them regarded that as a wasteland of impure half-breeds. But Jesus said, you're my witness in Samaria. And then he says, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Gentiles, uttermost parts of the earth, fodder for the flames of hell. But Jesus says, you're my witness right here in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Listen to me. It was not easy then but empowered by God, the Holy Spirit, they did it. That's what the book of Acts is all about. Acts 1 through 7, Jerusalem is reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 8 through 12, Judea, Samaria, reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 13 all the way through 28, the uttermost parts reached with the gospel of of Jesus Christ and there's old brother Paul receiving the Macedonian call and aren't we thankful for the Macedonian call he receives the Macedonian call and he takes the gospel from one continent into the next continent the gospel moves from Asia into Europe ultimately 
to that continent where our forefathers would hear about Jesus. And here we are in the United States of America tonight because there were a band of believers who came and founded a new nation where they could worship God according to the dictates of their heart and not according to the dictates of a king. Why? Because of the Macedonian call. Wow. It wasn't easy then. And can I tell you, lay aside the uttermost parts, lay aside Samaria, lay aside Judea, for you and for me, Jerusalem has never been more difficult. Brother Johnny, am I right? It has never been more difficult to share the gospel right here than it is right now. Never been more difficult. Gospel hardened. And listen to me tonight. I'm optimistic because I pray for revival. You need revival. I need revival. America needs revival. But hear me tonight. If revival tarries, it's not going to get easier. It's going to become more and more difficult. If you don't hear anything else I say tonight, I want you to listen to this before I close. The days of cultural Christianity in America are over. They're over. And it's going to be harder and harder to live the Christian life. I don't worry about me so much because most of my life is lived that, that seems odd for me to say because I think I ought to still be about 18 years old. I love Brother Johnny's way of thinking about age, don't you? But I feel like I ought to be a 20-something year old, but I, I'm not. And there's more life behind me than there is ahead of me. There really is. There's more sermons behind me than there are ahead of me. I don't worry about me so much, but I think about our children and we better pray for our children. And if you love the children of this community and you love the children of America, you better be on your knees praying for revival. Amen. We need revival. God send Holy Spirit revival on America. Amen. But if revival tarries, it is not going to be easy. But hear me, there is no plan B. Either the church takes the gospel or the gospel won't be taken. Amen. Either you and I engage the mission or the mission won't be engaged. Listen, the answer is not in Washington. The answer is not in Frankfurt. The answer is not in the courthouse over in Somerset. But the answer for the ills of our community lies within our hands. It's the glorious Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the mission. It's the mission. It's the mission to which we've been called. And if things are going to change in America, Baptists, we better engage the mission. We need to be like the old Marine. Do I have any Marine Corps veterans in the room tonight? I know Brother Carter is a great veteran. Others of you are veterans of other armed services. Something about a Marine, though, you know. Marine Corps, when it was founded about 200 years ago, they looked high and low for the motto. What's going to be the motto of the Marine Corps of the United States of America? And finally, they found a good one. The old Latin expression, Semper Fidelis. They've shortened it over the years to the point now you can look a Marine in the eye and say, Soldier, what's your motto? They have a way of saying it. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. May I tell you tonight, we need Christians and we need churches that will toe the mark and say, Semper Fi. It's not easy. But I will forever be faithful. That's what it means. Forever faithful. Are you going to be ever faithful to the mission? You're going to be on mission for God. Don't get distracted. 
you better rely on God's power for the mission. You don't have the power. There's not enough money to win the world for Jesus Christ. We need God's Holy Spirit power if we're going to reach Pulaski County, Kentucky, United States, and the world for Christ. And then bless God, we've just got to go out and do it. When it's hard, go. When it's smooth, go. Our command is to go. I want to encourage you tonight. This is revival. And you may be here and and you're really not committed to the mission. Oh, you give a little money, you may pray a prayer or two. But, but what about those up and down your street? What about your family members? What about your friends? What about your classmates that are lost and dying and on their way to hell? Are you committed to God enough? Are you committed to the mission enough that you're going to share the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? You share it. You share it, or it might not be shared. Wouldn't it be something if we could come in tomorrow night and everyone here tonight brings back one friend? I'm not a good mathematician. I'm really not. I hardly know that one plus one is three. But listen, if we'd all come back tomorrow night or one night this week and bring one friend with us, we'll double our crowd, right? What would it be like if we just bring a friend or two with us that's lost? Do you have lost friends? Do you have a lost husband? Do you have a lost wife? Do you have a lost classmate, a lost neighbor, a lost nephew or a niece? What would it be like if we could bring lost friends to church with us and they would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? I think we're having a revival here, but I'd love to see some people get saved this week, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be something, Brother Carter, if Wednesday night rolled around, we just couldn't stop because God was doing something marvelous in this place that we just couldn't push the stop button on. Wouldn't that be great? Listen, it could happen. It can happen. But if it happens, Semper Fi will be a move that only God can bring as we're on mission with Him. Are you an on-mission Christian? If not, tonight I'm calling you to come. Come and repent of your sin of silence. Come and repent of your sin of not being on mission and just say yes to God. Maybe you're here tonight and and you realize that you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. I'm thankful I can tell you upon the authority of God's Word that you can be saved right here in this place tonight. The Bible tells me in Romans 10, 13, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can come. You can be saved right here tonight. Don't wait. Don't put it off. God's calling you, Christian friend, to return to being on mission. Lost friend, if God's calling you to come and be saved, come tonight. Say yes and amen to God.